everybody calls me Banky, that's the name that I got from my grandmother when I was young. I'm coming out here after 30 years, yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm gonna have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love, my family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts. Yeah, man, you learned quick up there, man, that they was, they was uh, busting that gun, man, just like they was on Wallace Ridge, man. It was crazy, you know, they, boom, they shoot at, at will. You know, it was like we was target practice up there, like they just didn't care, man. It didn't, it, you know, they had never, most of them people probably had never shot nobody before, so to them, they was able to shoot you, man, and, and it was an experience for them. It was something they could brag about, something they could talk about. They was all excited and everything, man. You used to... You know, just see them, man. They be gathered up around and they be whispering and talking and sharing stories. You know, we laying down all on the ground like, you know, some ants or something. Man, it was crazy. So I was like, man, I, I supposed to be on low land. Here it is. I'm still up here stuck in the mountains dealing with all of this foolishness, man. It was just, it was unreal, man. But, you know, like I say, you have to get yourself in that mind frame now to know where you at, to know what's going on, to, to, to peep out your surroundings. And, and, and be on, on, on point at all times, man. Because you ain't even got to be in a fight. You can be around a fight and them pellets get to flying and you mess around, man, and lose an eye or something, man. And that was always, like I say, one of my big concerns with being on these prisons that had these guns and stuff, man, was, you know, ended up getting shot on a humbug or getting shot with something that I wasn't even involved in. But up while, up uh, River North, man, they, they them dudes, man, they knew... Because now, you know, I guess they'd have been in the system or they'd have been, you know, up in the mountains or they know with these guns, you got to move different. You got to act different. You see what I'm saying? So when they would have beefs and it was a lot of them up there, man, especially with that gang stuff, it was a lot of beefs. When they would have beefs, man, they was going in the cell and getting it in. But it's like I told you, when you go in the cell with somebody, man, you, you go in at your own risk. Because if you're not sure you can win, you're not sure you can come out victorious, then you put your life on the line. Because like I say, when you get to rumbling with a dude, man, he in, in prison, he's going to try to shine on you. He's going to try to do, you know what I'm saying, what he can do to you because of the simple fact that he want to send a message to the next person that might want to come in the cell with him. He want to send a message to anybody who might be looking like, look, I ain't the one. I ain't the one. This is what going to happen to you if you deal with me. So it's a dangerous situation. And then... You always got to pick whether you're going in somebody else's cell or they come to your cell. Because if worse come to worse, if somebody get hurt real bad or they, you know, incapacitated or unconscious and the people come, they're going to want to know, like, well, what are you doing in this cell and how he get like this? So you you going to put yourself in a real bad situation, especially if you get stuck in the cell and that happens sometimes. And then when the people come, then you stuck. But if it's your cell, you got more of a defense. Like, you know, I'm in my cell, man. Whatever happened, man, I'm defending myself. So it's a tricky situation, but also too you got to take in, in point if you go in somebody's cell, or even if somebody come in your cell, they might have that Bethlehem with them, man. They might have that Bethlehem with them as a backup in case they can't win the fight, if they case they feel like they you know they losing and they pull it out. And I've seen that happen. Dudes go in the cell, man, and then come out bleeding and, and run into the uh, booth and try to get some medical assistance, man, because they bleeding it there. You know, they hurt. They that bad. You know what I'm saying? And um, they was going in themselves up there getting it in, man. I mean, on a regular basis. And it always is <laughs> always one dude to come out there, man. And then next thing you know, if he lucky, he coming out there just knotted all up, busted up, face swole up. You know, he ain't lose no teeth or nothing like that. But he, he messed up. Now he got to walk around. You know, if he don't go to jail, if medical don't pull him, he got to walk around with his face beat all up. And that's what them dudes was doing, man. They throw on shades or they stay in their cell, have to miss meals because they also trying to duck the officer for seeing them like that. Because if the officer see you bust up like that, they're going to take you to the watch commander office and ask you what happened. If you hold solid and try not to say nothing, they probably going to lock you up for investigation. So either way, it's a lose-lose situation for you. So, you know, you're going to jail if you don't tell. And if you do tell, then you got a snitch uh, tag on your name and you stuck. You know, because every time you come out, oh, he's snitching, he boo, boo, boo. And then you might end up in another situation, maybe even a worse situation, you know. But, yeah, I, I got the dynamics of that joint real quick. And it was a lot of young people on there. It was a lot of young people. It was some sprinkles in of dudes that had been locked up a long time. But it wasn't as many as the new people. 
So we was basically like me, I had been locked up for a minute already. So dudes like us was basically like trying to, you know, implement our philosophy and the way we do time in, in these young dudes because they was being carried and they're gonna try to carry the whole institution. And only the dudes that have been locked up a long time was gonna be able to stand up for it and be able to show these dudes how you supposed to do time. Hey yo, they carrying us like this, man. You you know, you can't go for that. You you know what I'm saying? But they didn't know. So whatever these people was trying to impose on us, and, they, and trust me, they was handling us up there, man, because they, they calling all these shots, they, they calling, running everything, and they got these dogs, man. Their dogs was their biggest uh, uh, scare tactic up there opposed to the gun because they keep the dogs so close to you, you walking out the hall, going to the kitchen, they got the dogs in the hallway, they got the dogs on the boulevard, they got the dogs by the kitchen, they got the dogs by the gym. Everywhere you go, they had them dogs up there barking and down up on you, man. I mean, close to you, within a feet away from you, no matter where you go. It's almost like they can almost grab you if the, if the person is holding, the canine person, don't have a good hold on. And everybody that I knew up there was complaining about them dogs, man, because of the way they was doing. They was writing it up, writing it up, but they just kept on, you know, siding with them. Oh, they doing their job. Oh, you stay in the lines and you ain't got to worry about it. Oh, uh, okay, well, we, we going to take note of that. Oh, this dog person is talking crazy, running their mouth. They don't even supposed to talk to you at all. They just supposed to deal with the canine. It's the officer's job to tell you what you're doing wrong or, what you, or, or when you're out of balance. It's not their job. But they was going above and beyond their job description up there, man. And a lot of that came be because they had uh, they had put a new uh, major up there, and the major was a female, right? And she was a uh, she was a Caucasian female, and I knew her. She used to be on Power Ten, and her she was up there. Nepotism, nepotism. She was up there. Her sister was up there. Her other sister was up there. Her mother was up there, and I believe her grandmother was up there. And they was on Power Ten, but on Power Ten, the, 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 the administration is, is, is mostly black, but you had uh is 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 maybe like 60-40. But you had, you know, some some uh, Caucasian officers up there too. But the people that was in a big part of the administration was 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 usually uh, African American people. But they was up there, man, and I can remember her, and they was up there when they in that land. Uh, power ten, that's flatland. When they on there, they acting cool, they acting all right, they acting cordial, you know, they being trying to be professional. Man, up here, this 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 lady had this job, man, as the as the major. Man, she was letting her true self come out. She was straight racist, straight uh gangster, no nonsense, ain't want to hurt nothing you had to say. Anything that you say that was uh uh opposed to what she was saying, uh lock him up. Oh, oh, yeah, get him too. Lock him up. Oh, you got something to say? Oh, take him to jail too. And that's how much power a major got on the institution. All they got to do is say lock you up, you locked up. All they got to do is say lock the block down and the block locked down. They say lock the institution down, the institution locked down. As I've told y'all in previous videos, the major on most institutions runs the day-to-day -day activity on the compound because they are the head of security. So they're basically going to do what they want to do and then just report to the warden and tell the warden, well, oh, I locked them down because I felt like they it, it was some gang tension in the block. Or oh, I locked them down because, you know, there's a lot of robberies going on in there. Or, or, you know, anything of that sort of nature, they can just do it and then justify it to the warden or the system warden. And 10 times out of 10, the system warden or the warden is going to favor in, in, in their favor. So you ain't had nothing coming if the major was against you or you or the major didn't like you. You ain't had nothing coming, man. You, you just going to have a hard way. So dudes would normally, like I say, pipe down when they see the major because they know, you know, what the threat was with the major. And especially when you got a major that's like that, that's just nasty. And she was nasty. You see what I'm saying? So when she come in the block, she might walk in the block. Everybody holler, the major in the block, the major in the block. So everybody get on point and, and you know what I'm saying, be prepared for whatever. Because like I say, she might just walk and look at all the cells, see something that she don't like in your cell, and then get the people to pop the door, come in your cell, and get some officers to shake your cell there. Anything that they find in there that's out of bounds, she going to give you a charge for. Anything that she feel that's too out of bounds, she might say, just go ahead and lock him up. You see what I'm saying? And that's what we had. Her name was Mullins. And she was, uh, she was a piece of work, man. And um, the thing that was going on on this compound too, though, like I say, when you got a new compound, you got these new officers. 
You got these new counselors. You got these the new people that never worked in the system before. So like I say, more or less, they was green too. They didn't know the system and they didn't know a lot of things. They was learning on the fly at our expense. Because even though they green and even though they don't know the system, they still got control over our life. Yeah, they got control over our life. And that's uh, something that's a wake-up call for all these dudes that's out here now, man, that's free. You got to understand, man, they'll put people in position to have authority over your life, and they don't even have authority over their job. They don't even know what their job description, description is in full detail. They don't even never worked in a system before. They may be younger than you. They may be 19, 20 years old, but they have total control and total power over your life. You see what I'm saying? If they say you did something, believe you did it. If they want to cross you up, if they want to lie on you, if they want to do anything that they want to do just because they don't like you, your disposition, your, your attitude, your look, anything, your comment, they can cross you up. It ain't nothing you can do about it. You can scream bloody murder and say, oh, they lying, da 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 People going to always side with them, 100%. 100% they're going to side with them. But like I said, being that they was new and... You did have dudes up there too that they, 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 they gonna take advantage of them because of they them being new. And especially the females. Because I can remember, man, up there, they bring the commissary. They bring the commissary in the block. You gotta order your commissary, put your put your order form in, put your slip in or whatever, like about four or five days before you get your commissary. They get all the slips, they process the commissary, and they got these big old cots. And they'll bag up all of your stuff and put your receipt in there, put your name with the tag, and they'll push all of these cots over there to the block that might got commissary that day. If our block got commissary that day, you know, they got a designated time, they coming in there, they'll bring it in, they'll lock all us down, and you'll see all of these commissary ladies out there, you know, it's usually all ladies that work in the commissary. You'll see all these commissary ladies out there pushing all these cots in there, like eight to 12 cots, Full up with bags of commissary with everybody ordered in there for that week. And man, they would either, first they started coming to your cell, bringing the commissary. So they'll bring the bag to your cell. You may have a, 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 a commissary lady at your door, you know, popping your slot and, you know, reading out each, each item that you got and giving it to you personally and checking it off the list, making sure you got everything you're supposed to have. But what happened was, being that this is a new institution, and like I say, the dude's going to take advantage of them too. There's new uh, commissary ladies, women that ain't never worked in the system before, don't know the system. Man, these young dudes was taking cold advantage of them, man. They was getting them up there to themselves and getting their commissary, man, and they was uh, <laughs> they was gunning them down, man. They was, <laughs> they was put, putting the thing on them, man, you know, and it was crazy because... The women was new and they had never seen that like that before, you know, just coming in the system. They ain't know what to do. They was green. They was like, you know, in all, like, is this really happening? And what I, if y'all been following my channel, you should know what gunning is. Gunning is, you know, more or less dude is masturbating in front of a female officer. So he's exposing himself and masturbating in front of the female officer. These officers and these women were so green and so new to the situation, they ain't know what to do. Dudes was actually telling them, like, stand there. I mean, some of them was even coming back and saying, man, uh, she she said, uh, she told me, say, do you suppose be doing that? And, and I just told her, yeah, don't worry about it. Just go ahead. Keep on counting out my commissary. So they would actually stand there and watch these dudes masturbate, you know, not knowing that, you know, they could just go to the administration or go to their supervisor and say something. Bing bong, you you late, they come and run into your cell, locking you up, probably beating you up, and, and some more stuff. So this was going on for a minute, and none of them won't tell it. So now, you know, it's just like a gossip arena. Everything's spreading around. People know, oh, man, the commissary ladies do this. They do that. Oh, they be watching you. They So, man, dudes was just waiting. Dudes was ordering commissary just for the uh, female officers to come to their cell. And they take turns on them. You know, one dude to go get in the bed and cover himself up with the sheets and pillow so he can't see his cellar and the cellar be there. And then when he get his commissary, they switch out. And the women was just standing there, man, going for it. I don't know if they liked it. I don't know if they was afraid. I don't know if they just was in awe and didn't know what to do. But it was going on for a minute, man. And then I think one of them, she... Must have got tired of it or whatever or felt some type of way. She went down there. She said something to uh, her boss. Her boss said something to the supervisor. The supervisor called the major. The major came in there, 
the major, like I told you, she was crazy anyway. She walked straight to the dude's cell. Which one? Who? Who? So she goes to a dude's cell. Say he was he was exposing himself. Said, yeah. All right, boom, lock him up, pack yourself up, woo, woo, woo. So they come running up there to get him. So now the cheetah says something, all the rest of the female officers that work on the commissary, they're like, well, they did me too, or they've been doing me too. So, man, it was a crazy scene. She get in the middle of the park, make an announcement. If I find out anybody in this block is exposing themselves or masturbating on my commissary people, my female officers, I'm telling you right now, you're going up under the jail and you're going to get shipped up off here and you're going back up to Red Onion or Wallace Ridge. And, and, you know, she's screaming and hollering, making all of this noise, telling people, threatening people. And I heard she went from each block saying that because now she knows a thing. And then she started threatening her female officers and the commissary lady. If any of y'all see this and don't report it, and I find out that you don't report it, I'm going to get you fired or I'm going to get you suspended. So it was just a crazy thing, all about gunning, you know what I'm saying? Because like I said, the institution knew. They learning as they go along, but she won't knew. She knew. But the crazy part about it is when she was on Power 10, she know definitely about it because she, <laughs> she experienced it hundreds of times. You know, but now that she's in a power position, she making power moves and she calling shots. Yeah, she calling shots now, man. So she ain't going for nothing because she don't have to. Like I say, she ain't got the answer to nobody. So like I say, she was taking full advantage of that. And she, you know, everybody knew when she was around, man, tighten up, man, get in order, man. Because if she see anything wrong or she see anything that she don't like, she definitely going to speak on And she was a little bitty lady, man, probably about like, Man, 130 pounds, man, you know, and she acting like she uh, got, go, go, Godzilla or Gorilla or somebody because of the power that she had. You know, power is intoxicating, and when you put that power in, in anybody's hands, nine times out of ten, they're going to abuse it, you know, especially in a position like, you know, a prison setting. And that's what she was doing, man. She was taking cold advantage of any situation she could, and she wanted to instill fear in the inmates as well as in her own officers that she was just no nonsense. She was bucking for warden. By now, she probably made warden. I don't know because, uh, you know, I ain't been around her in a minute, but I'm quite sure she might have made warden by now because the next step up is assistant warden and then warden. And like I say, they they promote that type of uh, aggressiveness. They promote that type of treatment when they know that you're going to be pro-administration and you really don't care what an inmate got to say, what a convict got to say. You just pro-administration. They promote that, you know, so she was prime candidate, you know, to keep moving up in the ladder as long as she kept the same attitude that she kept, man. And uh, I stayed out of the way because I knew her and I knew her from back then. And like I say, I didn't try to mingle with the uh, administration at all. You know, it had to be something that I needed or something that I had to request for me to really be mingling with them because at the same time, I understood where they was. I understood the position that they was in. And even when you ran across some officers that was okay, you still had to keep it at a minimum because you know when push come to shove, it's going to be you against them. You know, and like I say, not all officers is bad. I'm not saying that by no means. But I do believe if you stay in that system long enough, you will be corrupted. You see what I'm saying? Because you're working for a crooked system. And if nothing else, you're going to learn that you're working for a crooked system by being in the system. So if you still choose to stay a part of that, then it's going to be, you know, come down to a decision where you're going to have to speak up on something that you feel is wrong. Speak up on something that you see is wrong. And if you don't, then just because you say, I don't want to get involved, you know, but you know it's wrong and you don't speak on it, then you have became a part of the system. You know, you may not be participating in it, but you know what's going on. Wrong is wrong. You know, you either going to say something or you're not. You know, but if you watch injustice and you don't try to straighten it, then you're a part of injustice. And, you know, like I said, that that what was going on in there at that time. And I can say I can say it was a lot of dudes up there that I had ran across that I hadn't ran into in a long time, man. You know, shout out to George Lynch. I just got a a, 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 a video from him, not a video or um. An email from a man um just the other day, man, still fight for his liberation. I can remember when he came in there, man, he was uh <laughs> he was a little dark skinned chubby kid, man, from up my way, man, out of DC, man. Tall, big go dude, but he was all chubby and everything. And man, he was young, you know, 18, 19 years old. And now to this day, man, I think he been locked up probably about 30 years, 30, 31 years, man. And I hadn't seen him for years and years and years. 
probably over 15 years. And when I run back into him, man, he turned all of that the transformation that you run into when you be around dudes doing a lot of time. Sometimes you run into him, man, and some dudes have made such a great transformation, man, you know, be it good or bad, that you be like, wow, you know what I'm saying? And that's how it was when I ran back into Black, man. We called him Black. And, um, man, he had, you know, turned all that chubbiness into muscle, man. He one of the biggest dudes in there, man, because he was already tall, like 6'4". He big as I don't know what. He's just been lifting weights for the past 10 years. And, man, I was like, whoa, man, oh, yeah, you done put some work in, soldier. You done put some work in. He was like, yeah, ain't little no more. He flexing on me and everything, man. So I ran into him. That's why I met Ty Pretty. You know, salute to Ty Pretty. Ty Pretty was his selling. You know, and Black Thing was he liked to stay on that basketball court. You know, he loved to play, and he a big dude. And like I say, he had a decent game, but he, you know, he ain't no, he ain't no uh, uh, Scottie Pippen or nothing. But you couldn't tell him that. So then when he get on that court, even way back then when he was younger, he used to always get on that court, get to arguing because he hate to lose, and then he end up in a scrap. Now he gonna he gonna go for his. Ain't no question. He ain't gonna back down or nothing like that. Almost had us in a whole lot of jams back in the day because, like I say, dudes would get the rumbling, man, and then their buddies would facilitate and want to get into it as well. And then you got the D.C. mob, so we like, man, nah, it ain't going to be none of that. It's going to be one-on-one -on -one or it's going to be an all-out brawl in here. So Black stayed in those type of situations, messing with that basketball court. And here it is, years later, he still got his butt on the court, still thinking he can run with the young boys. And, man, he was out there, man, and just... After every game, man, he, he argued with somebody about something. All right, when we get back in the building, let's go in the cell. Let's go, I'm going to punish you. You know, and they scared of him, man, because like I say, most dudes is fear of size anyway. Now, this, you got this big, uh, black, dark-skinned, bald-head dude, man, 6'4", about 240, and he telling you going up in the cell with him, man, them dudes is terrified, man, and black going to talk to you so vicious, you know, like, yeah, come up in the cell, I'm going to break your neck. You man, them dudes were scared to death, man. I used to say, Black, calm down, man. Calm down, man. No, I'm just tired of them. I'm tired of them, youngin'. I'm tired of them, man. You know, they keep on playing with me. I'm like, man, you better try to get up off these mountains, man. These people shooting up here. No, I'm going to take them in the cell. All right, man, these people shooting up here. You know, and like I said, that gun, man, that gun will tame you, man. But they was rumbling up there, man. They was getting it in. Ty Pretty was one of them, too. You know, Ty Pretty going to rumble when he get on that court. And Ty had a good game. But them dudes will get mad when you got a good game. Dudes be mad. They be jealous of you. You get on that court, Ty tell them straight up, I don't even want to talk. Back to the cell. Let's go back to the cell. So, man, yeah, Ty and Black was in the same cell. So dudes was shook at them when they get on that basketball court. But it was going down, man. You had a lot of little uh, gang members up there, man. You had the Bloods, the Crips, and all of them. They, 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 was, they was thick up there. They was thick, and they was getting their thing in, man. They was, you know, putting pressure on dudes, uh, extorting dudes, taking their commissary, you know what I'm saying? And the big thing up there was them holiday packets. We used to get order these holiday packets. Once they started off, it was once a year. This one, you can order some outside food from a, a vendor. You know, it's like once a year, and we call it the holiday pack because it usually came around one of the holidays. But when you was able to do that, you was able to get some food that they didn't have on the commissary. Most dudes, if they was able to do it, they was going to do it because of the simple fact that, you know, you get tired of eating the same thing over and over and over again. Even if it be the kitchen or be the commissary, the menu ain't going to change. So when you can get a holiday package, man, and order you, you know, $100, $150 worth of stuff, you know, you try to make that last, incorporate it into your meals or whatnot. Man, they was getting them holiday packages up there, man, and them blood dudes and crypt dudes was down on them. Won't no need to get one if you couldn't hold it. Because they coming and get it, man. I mean, they coming and get it. I remember, man, these dudes, man. They was kicking it with the dude, man. They grew up with the dude. They from the same neighborhood as the dude. But the dude had people that looked out for him. They sent him money all the time. You know, and this this when the vultures come in in prison. You know, they be vultures in there because they ain't got it. And they trying to find a way to get it by any means necessary. Man, I can remember they used to be kicking it with this dude, kicking it with this dude. This dude was a light-skinned dude, man. He worked out a lot. He had a little size to him, but you could tell he really won't, you know, he won't about that life. But he was a good dude, and he had a lot of talent. He just sold, man. Dudes had shorts that these sold up. He could sew. He can draw dudes, these stuff. Drawing, he can draw. Make cars to send home. He can make cars. He was a multi-talented dude, right? And a lot of dudes messed with him. But, man, when that holiday pack came, and some dudes that got, you know, 
good support on the outside. You can't order with one holiday pack in your name. But dudes that had good support might be like, they can get three, four holiday packs because they got people that will send the money and buy it for them. So what they would do is they would go around to another dude that they know didn't have no money, didn't have no support, and say, let me get my people to order a holiday pack in your name for 150 and I'm going to give you $40, $30 worth of commissary for, for letting me order one in your name. So a lot of dudes would do that because it was a come up for them. They're getting $20, $30, $40. Some dudes are getting 50 Fifty dollars worth of stuff just for using your name, but when the package came on 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 uh, package day, then you would see when the doors open and everything. When the people leave, dudes would go to the sale and be picking up their bags that they ordered from somebody else. You know, give them what they supposed to give them and take the bags to the sale. So you had some dudes in there that might get four, five, six bags. You know, sometimes I used to get three, four, five of them myself because my sister. You know, shout out to her. She used to tell me, man, get however many you want. I, I just send me the names and stuff. So she used to order me something like that. But like I say, if you can't protect it, it ain't no need to get it. Because you got vultures in there and they will come take it. And I can remember this dude, man. He had got about four or five packages, man. And man, I seen it. I can see the move. When you've been in there as long as I can, you can, you can feel the vibe and the tension. And you always be on point anyway when you've been doing time. You know like on days like this or commissary day, it might go down. So I can remember, man, seeing them dudes, man. They was lurking around the cell, walking, looking in other dudes' cell, seeing who got bags, seeing who got packages. It was the little blood dudes, and they was, they was on their thing, man. They was on their thugging. And, man, I remember them going to the dude's cell because where I was sitting at in the block, I could had a good vantage point to look right in the cell. So they going in there, talk to him, and I, I ain't think nothing of it at first because I thought they might have been recruiting him to come help them do something. But it's two of them going there, and they all three in the cell, and the dude is sleeping there, and the two blood dudes is one in there. Then you got, I see the other two or three blood dudes come stand outside the cell. So they in there talking to him and talking to him or whatever, and then the next thing you know, boop. They fighting up in there, rumbling. While one of them rumbling them, the other one started grabbing bags. He take one bag and throw it out the cell, grab another bag, throw it out the cell, and he go back in there. But the dude that was rumbling him, he started rumbling back, and he just was getting out on him. So now both of them jumped on him. So now they in there tussling with him, rumbling with him. Now another dude from the outside come in. He grabbing bags. Now they start taking the bags to their cells, and they in there rumbling the dude. Man, the dude got the wiggling and, and, and moving around, and he come up out the jump. You know, so he get about the sale, he get to run in his mouth and Harley, and they tell me, y'all be quiet, what you trying to get the police involved? You he like, no, y'all take that, y'all take that, y'all broke, y'all broke, it ain't nothing to me, I can get some more, y'all ain't this, y'all ain't that, y'all trying, you know what I'm saying, y'all trying to carry me, it's all good, yeah, y'all broke, y'all need it, I don't need it, you know what I'm saying, so they like, man, calm down, stop making all that noise, you snitching, you dry snitching, you trying to get the police involved, he like, no, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So he mad, so he goes to the phone. So when he goes to the phone, man, they go in the cell, take all the rest of the stuff. They taking everything, everything. So he done went and got on the phone. But what happened was when he get on the phone, he called his people. So he mad, he agitated. Now, whether he intended to do what he did, I don't know. Don't nobody know. You can only assume. But everybody know these phones is being monitored. These phones is being recorded. But he on the phone, and I guess his people can feel his tension and his voice or what he's saying. So he like, da 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 I guess he told him what happened. But I'm all right. I ain't worried about the woo woo. Boom. His people get scared on the street. They call up there. When they call up there, then the administration got wind of it. Boom, about 20 minutes later, they come bum rushing in there. Everybody lock up, lock up. Everybody go to your cell, go to your cell. They go straight to his cell. Now everybody thinking that he just snitched. He said he didn't. He just was talking to his people. He had nothing to do with what his people did. Don't matter. It's going to be a tag on your name from this point on. You know what I'm saying? They go to his cell. They done ran the camera back. They see everybody who went in and out of his cell. They see him coming out there, whatever, you know, hand gestures they can make because they ain't got no audio. They only got video, so they can't hear what was being said. They just can read the body language. Man, they can follow each one of them dudes to each cell that they went to taking his bags. They go to each one of them dudes' cells, lock each one of them up, confiscate all the commissary, lock him up. Dudes is hollering at him while he being took out there. Oh, you a snitch. You a snitch. You telling. You got on the phone and told him. Woo, woo, woo. So now he hollering. I ain't told nothing. I ain't tell nothing. You know what I'm saying? I ain't snitch nothing. So it's just a whole situation. But now he got a brand on his name. He got a tag on his name. For trying to protect this stuff. He was going to fight. 
he's he's fighting two dudes, and it's it's four or five of them all together. But he in the cell fighting for his. You know what I'm saying? But that just let you know that's how it goes in prison. You got to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. You know, he knew that he was going to have this stuff or he should have known if I'm going to have this stuff, I might have some problems. I got to be willing to protect this stuff at all costs, no matter what it is. You know, he should have had that Bethlehem in there and as soon as they popped off on a bing, 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 he should have got surprised and it would have changed the whole situation. And I know that might sound brutal. I know it might sound crazy, but that's the reality of prison. That's the reality of it. And man, this goes on every day in there. I mean, non-stop. So that's how it's going to go down. You just got to be ready for it, man. They come in there with all them dogs and the dogs is barking and they just waiting to put these dogs on people, man. And I'm going to tell you, man, they had one lady. She was a female canine dog, a canine officer. And she was super nasty. She like running her mouth. I know she had had a hundred complaints on it, but she always running her mouth and she always trying to antagonize people, man. And she get that dog so close up on you, man. It's like he just inches away from biting you. Man, she had a hundred complaints, but they just kept on leaving her in the same position. And when they did get too many complaints, they just move her from one building to the other. But man, she was something else, man. I remember I was leaving out the building one day and you have to walk through the metal detector when you're leaving out. So if the metal detector go off, they're going to tell you turn around and go back through it. So a dude was in front of me. He goes out and it goes off. I walk right behind him and it don't. The officer that's on the gate, he kind of knew. So he said, go back around. So when I come through, she said, hey, hey. And she in the hallway with the dog. She said, hey, you, turn around. I said, what? Turn around and go back through. I said, he won't even talking to me. She said, I'm talking to you. So I'm like, man, you know, and the irritation and the frustration is on my face because I know it's BS. So I turn around and I go back to get back in the line. Now I got to get back in the line that I done already went through because the rest of the people ain't went through yet. So when I turn around to go back, she and I'm, I'm, I'm walking because I guess she could see it on my face that I'm irritated because I was. So she said, no, you get out of the line. Get over here. Stand over here by the wall. I'm like, for what? She said, because I said so. And she got the dog. Rah, rah. So I'm looking at the dog and I'm looking at her. And my mind is started to go to another place because I'm getting ready to get in war mode now. So I'm like, man, so I step over there by the wall. I put my hands in front of me and I'm standing right there. So when the whole line goes through, she comes over there where I'm at. And I'm up against the wall. And this lady walked up to me, man, and had this dog. I'm talking about literally this dog was probably about 12 inches away from me. And he and barking at me and I'm up against the wall. She said, um, do you have a problem? Man, my temperature went up so bad, I'm looking at her and I say, do you have a problem? The bank is special. Yeah, pure deliciousness. Pure deliciousness, man. My name is uh, Banky, man. Everybody calls me Banky. That's the name that I got from my grandmother when I was young. I'm coming out here after 30 years. Yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm going to have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love. My family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts.